They say that confession is good for the soul. And since some believe that confession is one of the spiritual disciplines, I guess I'll confess. Well, I woke up and realized the sermon wasn't done. I woke up in a panic, realizing I had not finished the sermon. I flipped my feet across the edge of the bed. I felt my heart beginning to race. I felt my breathing increase. Oh my gosh, what happened to the weekend? It's Sunday, and I, I don't have the sermon complete. An idea flashed across my mind. We're talking about fasting. Well, tell them I am fasting from sermon preparation. <laughs> now that won't work. That won't work. I picked up my cell phone again and looked at the time. I'm running late. Oh my goodness. And then I noticed it's Friday. <laughs> I had one of those dreams like you have when you're uh, in school. You go to school in your underwear kind of dreams. Well, for ministers, we have that dream that it's Sunday morning and the sermon's not done. I have had one of those dreams, and it just blurred into Friday morning, but I was assured that it was Sunday, and I didn't have the sermon complete. I realized it probably made more sense to fast from late-night taco runs on Thursday night. That would probably keep me from those nutty dreams in the middle of the night. What is fasting about? Do we fast to create an excuse for our mistakes? Do we fast in hopes of changing some late night eating habit? Do we fast so that others see what we are doing? That's where Jesus had his concern. The sixth chapter of Matthew, in that passage that I read just moments ago, there seemed to be those that were choosing to fast, to give up food for a period of time, but they did it with a woe is me attitude. And not only did they have that woe is me attitude within themselves, they wanted to make sure everybody else knew how miserable they were. Oh, this is just so painful, but I'm doing it for the Lord. Oh, this is just miserable, but I'm doing it for God. I mean, that's what people were doing. And Jesus says those kinds of folks will get their reward. In fact, they've already gotten their reward because their reward is attached to their ego. And they want to make sure everybody sees what it is they are doing. I think part of the problem is that people think of fasting as a forfeiture. They think of fasting as something that, well, they're going to lose, they're going to surrender, they're going to have to relinquish. And darn it, if I have to get something up and it's going to be hard, it's going to be miserable, I'm going to make sure everybody else feels my misery and I'm going to do it out there so that people will notice. People will pat me on the back. People will say, way to go, you're impressive. People want praise and recognition. But is that what fasting is about? During this Lenten season, these 40 days leading us to, end, to Easter, here at Cypress Creek, we are having a Lent of Palooza. We talked about this last week, these two ideas that don't seem to go together. And yet that's so often what Jesus did. He reversed, if you will, what people had previously thought. There was a reversal of sorts as he took an old idea that was well known and he reimagined it. He reinterpreted it. He took what was old and dry and he reinvigorated it. Spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines like, like silence that we talked about last week or fasting today are not to prove our faith to others but to improve. We don't do them so that we impress God or others, but that God might be more fully impressed upon us. 
And so Jesus, in response to those that have that, oh, woe is me attitude in the midst of fasting, Jesus responds to them by saying, clean yourselves up, take a shower, put some makeup on, get some sun, put on your best clothes, and make it look like any other day. Because your reward is not found in what people think of you. Your reward is something that God wishes to give you. Twain was a young man that in advance of Lent pondered about what he should give up, what he should fast from. And as he kind of thought about his own life, he realized that he used to the word hate a lot. Not usually in a real mean-spirited way, but he seemed to hate a lot of things. Oh, I hate that. Oh, I, I hate that team. Oh, I hate. I, and he didn't really mean it, but he realized that it, it's a word that carries power. And so he chose to fast for 40 days from the use of the word hate. Which reminds us that fasting isn't just about food. It can be from all kinds of things. He said in the midst of his fast, from the word hate, he came across those words in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, where Jesus says, you have heard it said you are to love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute. Jesus already reversing this notion. As, as he began to ponder this notion throughout Lent, he said he came to a real realization of the power of words and how his words could be heard by others. And even though he didn't want to be a hateful person, even though he didn't want to be negative all the time, that's the way he was perceived. And so even after he got through the Lenten season, he made a, a certain proverb his passage for the rest of the year. And it was from Proverbs 12, and it says, Rash words are like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. He used that passage to remind and re-remind himself. Fasting is not magic. It's not a way we somehow turn God onto whatever we want. Okay, I want this, so I'll fast for a couple weeks. So maybe God will give me what I want. That's not what it's about. It's about opening ourselves up to what God desires to give us. It's about opening up ourselves to what I believe God has already been trying to give us. And yet there's been something in the way. Something that has kept us from receiving, from embracing that gift that God wants to offer us. Reverend Matthew Simmons made the decision to fast for 30 days. And for him, it was to fast from food. For 30 full days, only water, and once a day, he would twist lemon into the water. But that was it. For 30 days. And he journaled. He journaled every day about his experience in that fast, in his time of denial. And on day 27, he wrote this. I woke this morning expecting to echo the words of Jesus upon the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Matthew said instead, he found the taste buds of his soul savoring the spiritual sustenance of his Jesus. He went on to write, In my physical weakness, I more fully understood the words of my Lord when he said, I am the bread of life. An individual who fasted and yet ended up spiritually full. It doesn't make sense. And yet that's what happens so often. Jesus reverses. He changes what, what we thought should happen and, and offers us something completely different. A number of years ago, I was flipping through a magazine that had t-shirts that you could buy. And one of them said, I fast, therefore I am dot, dot, dot. And on the back it said, hungry. 
Yes, we are hungry. We are hungry. We're hungry for God. And as the psalmist wrote, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs, so my soul hungers for you, O God. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the right ways of living, for the rightness of God. We fast that we might feast. We abstain so that we might indulge. We let go so that we might more fully embrace the banquet feast that our God wishes to give us. It sounds absurd, and yet it's the way our God often works with us. Years ago, in the church that I was serving, and it was a church up north, we had a boiler problem. That's a problem we don't have to deal with here in Texas, but a boiler is how you heat the church. And we had to get a new boiler, $30,000. This was 17 years ago. This was a church that didn't have much money. But it went out in late spring, so we had some time. But still, coming up with $30,000. And then somebody in the church looked at membership and said, you know, we have about 100 people that give. And if everybody gave over the next 12 months, because we had six months before we needed to put it in, and the company was willing to give us six months interest-free, no payments. So we had a year to come up with $30,000. If everybody who gave gave about $300 over the next year, we'd be able to pay it off. Some would be able to give more, some would be able to give less. Well, Laura, one of the members of the church, kind of looked at her life and thought, how am I going to come up with 300 extra dollars? And then she made a decision that she would fast from what she called her frou-frou drink every morning. She would go into a coffee shop every day and buy a, then it was a whole $2, 17 years ago, be a lot more today, and she thought, you know, if I make coffee at home, I'll save at least a buck seventy-five. And for the next year, that'll be about 250 drinks. I'll save about well, more than $335 that I can give in the church. And slowly but surely, over the year, she gave a few dollars every week from the savings from her frou-frou drink that she did not buy. And they came for the boy. But what's interesting is that she didn't stop that practice at the end of the year. She continued to do that. Like I said, that was 17 years ago. And last I heard, 14 years ago, she was still giving that money. Except what she'd done, she looked to see what the cost of that drink was. And it now was like $4.00. And she was giving $375 towards this fund. And in the years, she had paid for scholarships for youth to go to church camp. She had given money so that a mission team could go to Venezuela. She gave money to help support a mission project. She had given money because she had this fund, because she had chosen to fast. She wrote, I never think about the idea that I have lost something, but what instead I have gained, what I have been able to give, and what I have been able to create. In a simple fast, I have been able to eat at the great banquet feast of our God. That's what she wrote about her experience of fasting, about letting go, about making room, about creating this opportunity. It's not an either or. It's not I can either feast or I can fast. I feast because I choose to fast. I feast on God because I've chosen to let go, put down, not consume, stop saying whatever it might be for you, for me. To some it may sound like losing. To some it may sound like a forfeiture, a punishment, reason to grumble. But Jesus says, Clean yourselves up. Make yourselves look good. Have a different attitude. Have a different expectation that it's not going to be a loss, but an opportunity. And 
And there may be that tendency to want to, oh, I don't like this. Oh, and there's that part of us that will want to have others look at us and go, oh, you're really doing great things for the Lord. But, but instead, just do it. Do it for yourself. And in doing so, God will gift you. Not in the ways we often think. But God is able to see you. See your real needs. And there, there God will bless you and allow you to feast at the great thing. You pray with me. God of abundance, you invite us to receive the plentiful nature of your love and Give us the courage to let go and to make room, to relinquish, not with a spirit of gloom and loss, but with optimism and expectation of what might be discovered. There is great hunger within each of us. And though we often try to fill it with things of this world, things that are not healthy, it is you, Lord, that truly will satisfy the hunger of our hearts. Lord God, spill into us what it is that truly need. But in the process, help us to, to let go, to make space, to put aside so that we truly can accept your gifts of grace and love, mercy and compassion. Those things that will let us feast at the table. Well, gracious God, there are many within our faith community beyond who are needed and we do lift up our sisters and brothers at South Austin Christian Church. We know that your grace already abounds among them and within them. God, we also lift up your wonderful servant, Patrick Kelly, who has served this church for so many years. Today's his birthday. We just love him and appreciate him. God, we also lift up Bobby and Brian, Brenda, Cleo, Jim, Cynthia, and Ruth. We also lift before you those who are grieving, Helen, Jimmy, Harry. God, we pray that you will continue to provide them care, and where there is an opportunity, we pray that you will empower us so that we can be instruments of your grace in the midst of those difficulties, in the midst of loneliness and hurt. Continue to encourage us in all things, God, and where there is an opportunity to 